Great, thanks, Ken. Um, so I work with the Union of DC Municipalities. Uh, just by a show of hands, who doesn't know or has heard of the Union of DC Municipalities? So everyone has their degree in So UBCM is a uh, is the local government association of DC. Uh, I think commonly referred to as the voice of the local government. Uh, I work uh, in the Victoria operations, uh, dealing a lot with some of the funding programs that UBCM delivers, uh, as well as some policy work as well. Um, previous to that, I actually worked at uh, the Ministry of Community School and Cultural Development for 12 years. I uh, worked in uh, the local government infrastructure and finance division of the deputy inspector of municipalities. Um, I, while I did work in uh, infrastructure and finance, I'm not an engineer and I'm not an accountant. I'm actually by education and uh, biologist and environmental technologist. Uh, so I, I'm more of a generalist, uh, which sort of irritated uh, my colleagues quite a bit. Um, coming to coming to a session like this for me, uh, like what what motivates me is, is making positive change. I, I, I'm I'm really focused upon moving towards a sustainable principles, particularly as they pertain to local governments. I come here and uh, I get energized. I learn a lot. Uh, because I'm surrounded by experts who are providing us some great information. Uh, and motivates me to move forward. Uh, you know, when I when I saw the, the agenda for today, I, I was a little concerned about asset management. How does asset management fit uh, into the, the discussion? And uh, you know, after listening uh, to, to the talks uh, this morning and this afternoon, I mean, that's all we've been talking about, actually, is asset management. Uh, so I, I'm happy. Uh, I'll continue. Uh, or maybe I don't have to continue because it's all been said. Um, so anyway, I, I'm going to talk, uh, I've kind of got three parts uh, to my, my talk. One is uh, going over, I guess, the, the principles of asset management. Uh, some of the principles, I think, that really pertain to what we've been talking about today. I'm going to go into uh, uh, the background, the history, uh, of the development of the framework uh, and uh, really the opportunity that uh, was provided to develop the framework. Uh, and then finish off by just sort of connecting that natural capital and natural services uh, component uh, to asset management. So what is asset management? Here's the challenge. Um, I can't read my notes about my glasses. I my glasses on, I can't see the screen. <laughs> Uh, Kim did say I would hold up, uh, you know, the, the framework document. I've got a box of framework documents. They're sitting right by my front door at home. Uh, and, uh, so if anyone wants to come by, they can pick it up. <laughs> I am a notorious. Uh, anyway, so what is asset management? Uh, th this was a, a definition developed by the National Asset Management Working Group, which was really a, a, a group of national or, or practitioners that came together, uh, I guess, approximately in 2005. I was under the National Roundtable for Sustainable Infrastructure. Uh, so an integrated approach involving planning, engineering, and finance to effectively manage existing and new municipal infrastructure in a sustainable manner, maximize benefits, reduce risk, provide satisfactory level of service to community users and environmental infrastructure. I think uh, you know, the, the, the shortcoming of this definition is when it talks about uh, planning, engineering, and finance. You know, asset management is really a, is a team sport. It is a corporate function. Uh, decision makers, I mean, there's all aspects within the local government uh, podcast that should be involved. When I heard some of the stories today, you know, I, I started thinking about asset management and the importance of asset management, you know, under the, the feast and famine uh, context. And uh, I saw an interesting article, it was in Asset Management BC newsletter, letter. it was about uh, the city of Calgary uh, when they were going through uh, you know, the flood in 2013. Uh, they actually uh, you know, gave credit to their asset management and their asset management plans uh, for their ability and how they were able to get back uh, and up and running 
again. Uh, even they went to the extent where they felt, felt that the asset management plan and the processes they had in place actually saved lives. You know, we're looking to a, another community that uh, suffered from floods, High River, they did not have asset management in place. Uh, they didn't actually know where to start. Right? They didn't know where their infrastructure is. Some of the basic components of asset management, like inventory and knowing where those pipes are under the ground, those waters receded. There was nothing but mud and uh, an high river. They had a tough time actually finding out where the pipes were to actually get some of the services. Started. Um, when you look at uh, uh, you know drought and adaptation and climate change, uh, you know there's been a number of sort of uh, uh, examples I think that was brought forward today. Uh, I look at John's uh, presentation on on demand. I think it was uh, Delta's uh, agricultural water demand and how you know they're going to have to manage increased demand for the same level of service and what's going to be required is additional. Right, so I mean, it, it's a challenge. You, you look at the Okanagan, uh, and, you know, some of those communities that have relied on some of those, uh, you know, on snowpack uh, and creeks for uh, you know their, their water supply. Uh, you know, dealing with climate change means they may have to reevaluate uh, where to get their water, where it is the big sink, where's the big storage. Uh, it's down in Lake Okanagan. What does that mean? They're actually pumping water. So. There's infrastructure, there's additional energy, uh, and you know, so these are the kinds of things that uh, local governments have to go through uh, when adapting to climate change to provide the service and perhaps just provide the service at the same level. So principle number one, it's all about the service. Uh, I wish it was never called asset management. And that's really where we went uh, when we developed the framework we talked about sustainable service delivery. Uh, because it's really not about the assets, uh, it's about the service. All right? Assets without service have no value. Uh, so when you think about service in the context of today, in the context of local government asset management, it's all the services, right? So there are services, there's the core local government services that are provided whether that's drinking water, wastewater, rainwater management, recreation, parks, roads, bridges. Uh, but there's also some of those uh, other services, uh, and look at in the context of parks, that nature provides. Right? Uh, and look at some of the services where that leverage nature to provide the service. So principle number two, it's actually about the level of service. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 uh, the pictures are roads, right? So uh, you've got the road infrastructure there, but what is the level of service? What's the level of service that's acceptable to your community? Um, you know, you can ask uh, Brian Soji uh, what happens when you tell your community that your level of service is going to change. Uh, you know, the level of service will no longer uh, allow for outdoor irrigation. Uh, it's a tough discussion to have. Uh, I look at uh, Fraser Valley Regional District. They've done some work uh, with respect to a strategy for small water systems. Uh, and they've got level of service integrated into that plan. Uh, so really what they're talking about is recognizing the cost of providing this service and, and the ability to provide this service in a sustainable manner. Uh, they've looked at prioritizing sort of level of service. So the number one priority is quality, right? So they will not provide a service for small water and small water system unless they meet uh, the drinking water protection act standards. The second priority is fire protection. So uh, fire protection becomes the second priority. Uh, so in essence, prioritizing actually uh, identifies what level of service and how we can provide that level of service. Of course, there's some of the challenges uh, with level of service when it's legislated. Um, I worked for the province for a number of years. Uh, now I, uh, I work for an organization that works on behalf of local government. When I worked for the province, uh, we called it empowerment. Now that I work for local government, I can call it downloading. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it is a challenge, 
uh, when uh, you know your service, the level of service is changed by legislation, you can't plan for that. Um, and that becomes a huge cost for local governments and a lot of angst for your time. So principle number three um, is, you know, operation and maintenance has to be considered. Uh, from the context of sort of traditional or core infrastructure, uh, you know, for most linear assets, you're looking at about 20% of your life cycle costs from the capital costs. Uh, when you're looking at vertical infrastructure, uh, your, your operating costs, your overhead costs actually increase dramatically. So that's, you know, when you look at the life cycle costs in the, in the OMM, uh, you're looking at decommissioning, you're also looking and considering um, uh, uh, you know, what is the replacement cost as well. It, it really becomes an issue, uh, you know, in making decisions on whether you're actually providing a service or not. Uh, so when I said it's all about the service, Sometimes those decisions are let's not provide the service. Uh, when I worked with the province, I uh, managed a lot of the uh, federal and provincial grant programs and had some pretty tough conversations with mayors and councils, uh, you know, asking for, you know, in, in a rural community of uh, 1,500 or, or, or 2,500, asking for uh, a multi million dollar recreation center. And, you know, you know, the question back to them was, should you really be providing this service? Yeah, a grant can give you some money to build it, uh, but you're going to have to operate it. Uh, you're going to have to operate and maintain it, and you're going to have to define a level of service. What's that level of service? Well, maybe it's going to be, you could be open from uh, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. every second Friday, because that's what you can afford. Uh, you know, maybe for recreation in your community. When I look at you know, the East Kootenai Regional District, uh, we'll sort of looking at the same thing uh, with uh, arenas and, and the need for additional uh, arena capacity. They actually put in a small project to uh, put some lights on uh, the cross box and, and some uh, infrastructure to actually flood those and trees that was in the uh, So, you know, they provided the service, uh, but they understood the cost. An important concept to remember. Interdependence. Uh, and a, a really important piece I, I already talked about is corporate function. It's a team sport. It requires everybody in the organization to be thinking about asset management and understanding how asset management impacts what they do. Uh, you know, Bob talked about sustainable development, and you know, I think over time that uh, has been a term that's been misused uh, more often than not. Um, and you know, and you, you really need to wonder what is uh, sustainable development. You look in the context of land use planning and the importance of land use planning to be part of an asset management process. Uh, you know, quite often what we're seeing right now is asset management kicks in once the assets are there in the ground. Uh, you know, when is the most important time to start thinking about assets and the cost of assets before they're built? Uh, and so, how we actually create our communities and build our communities is, is probably one of the key and critical pieces in moving forward with the, uh, asset management, the sustainable service delivery, and that delivery, when I say sustainable service delivery, it's, it's the right level of service uh, at the lowest cost possible. So I want to talk uh, briefly a little bit about uh, the background and the history of asset management in the province. Uh, I got involved uh, with asset management around, two, well, I guess it was around 2005 uh, when I was involved in the National Roundtable for Sustainable Infrastructure. I was working for the province at the time. Um, shortly thereafter, uh, through the Public Sector Accounting Board, uh, uh, 3150, has everyone, has everyone heard of PSAP 3150? No. Well, PSAP 3150 is an accounting standard uh, for uh, local governments, it's actually for all uh, public entities. Um, it talks about uh, accounting for your tangible capital assets. Uh, what that means is looking at your historical costs and appreciating over time. Before 2009, 
local governments did not have to do that. Uh, made it extremely difficult to manage infrastructure, to manage assets, and thus uh, manage services. So it, that kind of stimulated the, the, the discussions around asset management. And what it really did is, is looked at the shortcomings of PSAP 3150, and it actually didn't look at the whole picture. Uh, so there's a number of other steps, like actually what the replacement costs are, and uh, you know how to move forward. So PSAP 3150 uh, quite often referred to looking in the rear view mirror versus looking forward. Um, I was I was involved with uh, at the national level. Uh, there was a bunch of interest at the provincial level for moving uh, forward, and over about a two-year period, brought a bunch of stakeholders together and. Uh, discuss how to move forward with asset management. So the stakeholders, predominantly local government, local government associations, uh, provincial ministries, such as myself at the time, uh, we had First Nations. Uh, what, what spit out of that uh, process was the creation of Asset Management BC, which is the little diagram here. So Asset Management BC uh, is actually a leader in asset management, uh, recognized actually internationally. Um, You'll see some of the graphics uh, that were produced for the framework. Uh, I went to a national uh, workshop in October and I saw the same graphic in seven different provinces. Uh, so they've been adopting uh, the work that's been done in BC. So asset management in BC, and at, at the end I'll, I'll have the website, lots of information there. Singular objective to create and facilitate opportunities to share knowledge tools and information respect integrated asset management. Uh, so before I get into the asset management for sustainable service delivery framework, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the opportunity. Uh, the opportunity to create this document really came out of the gas tax agreement. Uh, so the gas tax fund is a tripartite uh, agreement uh, in BC. Uh, in BC, it's quite unique. Uh, the Union of BC Municipality is actually administers the program on behalf of the province. That only happens in one of the province, and that's Ontario, otherwise it's the province doing it. I've been involved in the delivery of grant programs for a number of years. Um, you know, the challenge on the provincial federal level has always been uh, moving forward with a merit-based program that promotes good behavior uh, without political interference. Uh, that's always been part of the job, is to get the politics out of it. Uh, on the UBCM side, there is no politics. So it's quite refreshing to be involved in this program. But within the gas tax program, uh, between the federal government, the provincial government, and the UBCM, there's an agreement to move forward with asset management. Uh, so there are asset management requirements under the agreement. So local governments, uh, to ensure that they get the, their funding, uh, there's three funding streams. Uh, one funding stream is just a direct allocation to local governments based on population. Uh, the other two, well, one is a uh, uh, pool that is application based, and the other one is direct to Metro Vancouver. Anyway, the 189 local governments, in order to get the funding, uh, they are required to move forward with asset management. The approach in BC has really been a bottom-up approach, uh, not unlike the approach taken by the Partnership for Water Sustainability, which is based on education, building awareness, uh, recognizing those that are doing it right, showcasing them, and encouraging other local governments and other stakeholders to do the same. The same approach has been uh, taken with uh, asset management uh, in BC. And uh, so resources have been developed, uh, but we're at the stage right now where a little bit of leverage, and that leverage is coming from the funding program, is encouraging local governments to move forward. I'll, I'll, I'll get into a little bit more detail of that. Good. So, the framework was created as part of the requirement under the gas tax uh, program. What it does is, is standardize an approach for all local governments to follow. Uh, 
recognizing that we're not telling local governments how to move forward with asset management at a very high level. Here is a common approach that's based on best practices that have been accepted in some of the leading countries like Australia, New Zealand, UK, <coughs> and across the world. It's moving away from asset management and focused on, on, on service delivery, uh, so sustainable service delivery. Um, and uh, it, it follows these, uh, uh, these principles for, so ensuring that current uh, community service needs are met, delivered in a social, economically, and environmentally responsible manner. Uh, within the documents, there's certainly some linkages to natural capital and natural services and the importance of them. Does not compromise ability for future generations to meet their needs. This is the big one, it's the intergeneration that, uh, intergenerational equity piece. Uh, you know, I, I look at my parents' generation, uh, they didn't get a free ride. Uh, and we're at the point now, I mean, one of our challenges, of course, at the local government level is you got a four year term and you got a hundred year old assets. And so how do you manage those? Well, usually what we do is you forget about them until the next term. Uh, you keep forgetting about them and you keep forgetting them. Um, so, you know, I recognize that, uh, you know, sooner or later, uh, you know, someone's going to have to pay. Uh, we better start now uh, because actually I'm, I'm thinking about my kids and uh, their ability to pay is probably going to be far less than my ability to pay. So, um, it, it's actually protecting some of the other generations or the future generations of the board. This understanding of trade offs between resources desired services. Asset management is not a silver bullet, right? Doing asset management doesn't solve all of your service uh, issues, right? But it at least provides you with the information to make good decisions as you move forward, right? If you do an asset management plan, you're not gonna all of a sudden find a pot of gold uh, once you're done. Uh, what you're gonna do is have really good information to help support decision making, and that's the key. So another definition, uh, this is the definition that's used within the framework. Asset management is a process of bringing together skills and activities of people, information about the community's fiscal infrastructure assets and financial resources. There's the wheel, uh, uh, actually, we'll, we'll talk about it, I've got another slide on that, but it looks awfully familiar uh, you know, when I look at uh, what uh, the graphic that Richard had on his slide talking about uh, looking at assessing, um, uh, planning, and implementing uh, within their community as well. So the core elements, we're recognizing once again, right, everyone's got to be involved. It's a corporate function, including elected officials, uh, people, information, assets, and finances. It doesn't happen without those four, of course, assets. It says physical infrastructure, uh, but rec recognizing that uh, you know, moving forward, uh, perhaps you know, with a bit of a paradigm shift, is understanding that natural capital and natural assets have to be part of this. Review, communicate, and engage. Uh, you know, I think no matter what you do, this is a critical piece. Uh, you know, I, I go back to uh, you know a sage. I guess now he's an ex-mayor uh, that provides some great advice and, uh, and it was a great quote and I've used it many times. And you know, it really talks about the importance about communication, building awareness and education. And uh, he said, it goes something along this, he was, you know, never move forward with a solution to an issue before you've built awareness about the issue Otherwise, the solution will become an issue. So, so it's key, and I see my brain at time, so I'm going to carry it on quickly. So the process, and I'm, I'm talking about asset management today without really talking about asset management, so I'm going to keep it at a very high level. Uh, but the process itself, uh, we, we've got the four core elements. Uh, we're talking about engaging, reviewing, and communicating with, uh, with the process. It's a continuous quality improvement process. So it's, a, it's, not, it's not a destination, right? It's a journey, right? It, it, it never stops, right? Asset management doesn't stop. It's not an asset management plan. Oh my God, I got a plan. I'm done. No, you don't. You're not done. 
So it, it's a process of assessing, right, capacity, demand, and results, planning what needs to be done, um, and then implementing those plans. Of course, there's a, a huge amount of resources available on the Asset Management BC website. It sort of takes you through each of those components if you're interested in learning more. There's actually training sessions available. There's actually a three-day introductory training session that you have at the end of it that actually spits out an asset management plan for a particular asset class for you. Uh, it's available uh, through NAMS Canada. Uh, so the integration of natural capital. Um, you know, local governments provide for ser services and are stewards of the physical infrastructure. Do you provide those services? Well, they're also stewards of the natural environment as well. Um, natural, natural capital provides services to us, right? It is integrated um, and no more integrated uh, than in some of the water services we provide. So managing natural capital, uh, water management, Water conservation, rainwater management. We talked a lot about soil, the importance of soil. Uh, you know, the talk of uh, vegetation, natural landscapes, protecting forest shore, uh, erosion protection. So integrating with asset management. So that sort of natural capital component integrated into a nap, an asset management plan. Uh, it, it, in many ways, it's levering nature, levering nature uh, to help provide the service. In particular, I'm thinking about rainwater management. Um, you know, you've got, and we talked a little bit over lunch about to assets that actually appreciate. Uh, you know, there's not many assets in a local government context that actually appreciate. They all depreciate, right? Once you buy them, the next day they're worth less. Um, you know, a tree actually provides you greater rainwater uh, management and protection as it grows, as it ages. Uh, so it's a consideration uh, as you're building rainwater management rainwater infrastructure is how you incorporate and, uh, and obviously we've got some examples of communities that are doing it and doing it very well. The other thing you can actually do is increase the level of service without increasing cost. So uh, Kim developed a, a bit of a graph here on the asset management continuum. Uh, it, it's sort of, it's, it's bridging two pieces or two ideals here. One is uh, the, the recognition that asset management is an incremental approach. Uh, within the province, some local governments are well advanced, some are just starting out. Uh, you know, our approach is not to dictate uh, or prescribe what to do. Uh, it's, you know, for instance, it's not, there's no way that we are saying Zimbellis has to do the same thing as the city of Vancouver. Um, they don't need to, right? They don't have to complexity of services, the infrastructure behind it. Um, but over time, as you put that uh, continued quality improvement process, uh, you know, the capacity and, and the expertise will increase with, with asset management. We're saying the same thing with respect to the integration of natural capital and natural assets, right? So uh, local governments, over time, you know, they start off, some of these local governments are starting off and they're really just dealing with the core infrastructure. That's what they're getting to understand. They're getting to understand asset management as a process. As they mature, they start, then there's the ability to sort of incorporate and integrate that natural capital uh, into their plans. So the desired outcomes, nature and natural capital is incorporated into local government asset management processes. Uh, recognize its financial value. There's some work being done at, at, a, at a national level with respect to natural capital. Um, improve service levels, so there's the opportunity to actually improve service levels by incorporating natural capital and improve stewardship, not only of services, the core services provided by local government, but stewardship of uh, environments as 